I will share screen. Uh, today is a more solemn day, so we'll skip the friendly greetings. I'm at the lucky end of the fast, though. I'm almost done. I'm in Jerusalem right now, so we only have a little bit over two hours left. People who are fasting in parts of America have much more. This was a picture I took this afternoon with my children. We went up to have a good view of the Temple Mount in the old city. Uh, we took this from Mount Scopus campus of Hebrew University today. A fresh picture. Today we'll try to talk a little bit about the background and the rituals of Tisha B'Av and we'll touch on some central themes that are part of the rituals of commemorating the day. So the, in Hebrew, Tisha B'Av means the ninth of Av. Av is the Hebrew month that we're finding ourselves in now. And this is a ritual fast day, which runs from sunset to nightfall, just like the Yom Kippur fast. The other rabbinic fast days of the year are only from sunrise to nightfall. So it's a longer one and it gets the same stringencies as we'll see as the Yom Kippur fast day. But as we'll talk about, as we just continue to discuss, Tisha B'Av is much more than just a fast day. Tisha B'Av is also a day of mourning. And it's a day in which we basically collapse all of Jewish suffering over the ages, and we blend it and merge it all into this one day. One of the things we'll try to talk about today are what are some of the events that we try to tie together today, and why would we do that? Why not give every event its own occasion or its own opportunity for mourning. The events at the top, above the red dotted line, those are five events that are mentioned in the Mishnah in Masachet Ta'anit, the rabbinic teaching from about many hundred years of years ago, from around 200 of the common era, it was written down. And in the Mishnah, they point to five things, five crises, five tragedies that occurred on this day in the Jewish calendar. Four of them occurred much, much later than the first. The first one appears in the book of Numbers in Parshat Shlach that we read a few weeks ago, earlier in the summer, and that's the sin of the spies, in Hebrew, the Meraglim. Just to refresh our memory, right, the Jewish people left Egypt with the plan of entering into the land of Israel shortly after leaving. There was no exact date given. They stopped at Mount Sinai, received the Torah. Moses went up for 40 days to receive the tablets. And the plan was, right, he would come down with the tablets and sometime shortly thereafter, right, God and Moshe would decide that it's time to begin to march into the land and begin to conquer and settle the land. But, right, things start to go wrong. First, there's the sin of the golden calf. The Jewish people are anxious for Moshe's return from the mountain, and they build a golden calf, a form of idolatry, and start to worship that. Moshe comes down, and as a result of that, breaks the tablets, and then has to enter into a lengthy process for the next 80 days of seeking forgiveness and reconciliation between God and the Jewish people. And then, right, on the date that we call Yom Kippur, so this is about half a year after they left Egypt, Pesach time, right? The Jewish people reconcile with God. God says, I've forgiven them. He gives the second set of tablets as a sign, like a new contract, right? A new a sign that the relationship has been restored. And then, right, the plan would be to continue to march into the land. There's a slight detour. They build the tabernacle, which is part of the reconciliation with God. And after dedicating the tabernacle, the following spring, so we're almost a year after leaving Egypt, it's now time to get the camp organized. And that's what we've been reading in the book of Numbers for the last few weeks in Parshat Shavuah. 
we read about organizing the camp for the purpose of beginning the march into the land. And then a group of people come, leaders come to Moshe and suggest that it would be handy and helpful if we enter the land like regular nations. So let's send some scouts, some spies to come back and give us information about how to approach the land. Moshe gives them a list of questions and they go on their mission. They return and give a report but they give a report that has two, at least two different problems. One problem is to whom they bring their report. They bring the report in front of the entire nation and Moshe and his brother Aaron, the priest. But they let everybody hear what's supposed to be classified important information that based on that, right, a strategy of conquest would be developed. And not only do they present the information to everybody, but they also give their editorial comments. They answer the questions that Moshe told them to answer about the land, but they also give their bottom line, their editorial understanding, which is that we'll it's a great land, but we will never make it. And therefore, maybe we should go back to Egypt. That's the people's reaction. The people hear the response and they're ready to turn around and go back. And as a result, Right? The people cry that entire night and God punishes that generation with 40 years in the desert. That sin, the sin of the spies, according to the rabbis, is the first of the tragedies that took place on this day of the year, on Tisha B'Av. And it has something in common with the next two. What it has in common is that this day of the year is has a root of rejecting the land and of rejecting the specialness of God's plan of bringing the Jewish people into the land of Israel. So the first sin took place in the generation of the desert when the group of spies came back, gave their report publicly instead of just to the leadership, gave their report with their editorial conclusion, which is it's a lost cause. And that caused hysteria and panic in the people, which led the people to reach the conclusion, let's just forget this whole plan of conquering the land of Israel and go back to Egypt. And for that, the Jewish people were punished. And this day on the calendar, according to the rabbis, was set aside as a permanent day of tragedy or of reflection on tragedy. The Mishnah that I mentioned then notes that the, both temples were destroyed on this day. The first temple in 586 BCE was destroyed by the Babylonians. And there we can read in the final chapter of Kings 2 of Malachim Bet. There we can read that the temple was destroyed starting midday on the 9th and continued burning into the 10th. The second temple right, was built when people began to return from the first temple destruction. The first temple destruction had a time limit. God told the prophets at the time of the first temple destruction that the Jewish people would go into exile in Babylonia for 70 years. And at the end of the 70 years, they were granted royal permission by King Cyrus of the Persian Empire they were granted permission to go and start rebuilding a new temple and rebuilding Jerusalem, which had been damaged 70 years before. Only a small minority of Jews heed the call and take the offer to go back. And they have great difficulty getting started to build the second temple. The second temple though, while they began to build it in this group of the returnees, 70 years after the first temple was destroyed, this second temple lasts for a very long period of time and reaches its greater period of glory much later in the Herodian period, as we're making the bridge between right, the end of the Greek era into the early Roman period. Right? King Herod builds the Temple Mount and creates a physical platform on which to expand the original temple. And it's that second temple that was expanded by King Herod that's destroyed in 70 CE by the Roman legions. So the destructions, both of the first temple and of the second temple, 
both took place on Tisha B'Av. The first temple one began on Tisha B'Av and continued into the 10th of Av. The second temple destruction certainly was set on fire also on the 9th of Av. The Mishnah mentions two subsequent events following the destruction of the second temple that represented the final nails in the coffin, the final blows to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, because the destruction of the temple came at the end of a four-year revolt against the Roman Empire. Imagine a small group of Jews trying to stand up to the great Roman Empire. Right? It was basically mission impossible, but it was driven by great belief, certain messianic hope that they could bring about a change. And when the second temple was destroyed, for most Jews that confirmed that the rebellion against Rome was over. But small groups of rebels fled Jerusalem to the environs, to the Dead Sea area, to what we call today Gush Etzion. Some fled to the towns in the north of Israel. And these rebels, these small groups of rebels, tried to keep the fire alive and keep some form of a, of a revolt against Rome continuing. About 30, 40 years after the destruction of the temple, the Roman governor at that time, whose name in Hebrew was called Tyrannus, Tyrannus Rufus, different, slightly twisted, different Latin names, he wants to build a new city on the ruins of Jerusalem, the city of Alia Capitolina. And he plows over, he raises the Temple Mount in order to build his new city. So that is considered a fourth tragedy that happened on Tisha B'Av because in case you thought, right, that the temple might be able to be rebuilt like it was after the first destruction, right, now the mount is raised completely destroyed. The fifth event mentioned in the Mishnah happens 65 years after the destruction of the second temple, and that is the fall of the stronghold of Betar in the Judean hills in today's Gush Etzion, which was one of the last rebel strongholds to try to continue to fight against the Romans. And that represented that city that fell, that fortress that fell, represented the final nail in the coffin and the completion of the destruction of Jer Jerusalem and the second temple. So according to the rabbis in the Mishnah, the Tisha B'Av commemoration commemorates these five events, but they share in common right, where it all began with the sin of the spies, that not all of the Jewish people, or in the case of the sin of the spies, all of the Jewish people except for just a few, right, rejected the gift of the land or the potential gift of living in their own land, having sovereignty. And that set into motion a series of events that would unfold over Jewish history that would cause the Jews to leave the land and then really have something to mourn over. What I put at the bottom are two of many events that if you Google to try to see what events happened on or around Tisha B'Av, these are two of many events that will pop up. The two that I put are the two largest expulsions of Jews from Western European Jewish communities. Whether or not they exactly happened on the date, on the week before, the week after, matters less than what it means in collective memory when Jews for generations say that yet another tragedy happened on Tisha B'Av. Because what that means is that Jews are trying throughout the generations to try to make sense of how events in the world are unfolding. Because if tragedy just randomly befalls the Jewish people and just kind of pops up on the screen, and you never know when tragedy is going to hit, then that often means that but you're looking at the world in a theologically chaotic way. But if Jews can look at the world and create some kind of theological order and sense, and they can see that the world has, right, somebody who's running the world, and that's God. And God has a plan. And yes, there are bad things that happen. 
First of all, then you have to ask the question of why they're coming to the Jewish people, these tragedies. But if, they, if the tragedies can be contained to certain dates on the calendar, Tisha B'Av and some of the other dates that the same Mishnah and Masechet Ha'anit describes, then it helps theologically begin to make some sense. In other words, God has times of joy, God has times of suffering. He doesn't just sprinkle suffering across the Jewish calendar. And there's a sense of order theologically and a little bit of a sense of meaning. What we do with all of this, though, is very interesting. How does one, right, take a day on the calendar and use it to discuss and commemorate events that span from the second year after the Exodus, the generation who left Egypt, several, several, several thousands of years to include the destructions of the two temples, and then continue that timeline going forward to events in the Middle Ages. There are certain dates associated with World War I and World War II that you'll often see connected with Tisha B'Av. How does one do all of that on one day? And that's what we'll try to talk about in the rest of our learning today. But first of all, when we try to talk about what this day represents, one of the ways in which we try to do that in rabbinic sources is by trying to understand why they happened and why especially the major events that we just talked about, the destructions of the two temples occurred. Because the thinking goes that if we want to bring about any form of correction and any hope for restoration, then we have to correct the ills that brought about the destruction in the first place. Because again, in a theologically driven world that looks and tries to make theological sense in tragedy, one answer is that our sins caused it. It's certainly a refrain that the Torah talks about, both at the end of the books of Leviticus and the book of Deuteronomy, the Torah devotes extensive space to a section of warnings, a section that says, if you keep the mitzvot, then God will reward you and provide all of the following needs and blessings. But when you don't keep the mitzvot as a community, then God will lead you on a different path. And it's a path that includes not only troubles and problems while you're living in the land, but the unfortunate end of both of those sections includes the possibility of destruction of the, of the community living in the land of Israel and exile from the land. But each of those sections also end with a happy ending, right? That even in your exile, God will have mercy and take the Jewish people back. So when looking at the temple's destructions, by trying to find the causes, the theological causes, what were some of the sins that led to the temple's destruction, that actually not only makes theological sense retrospectively, you can look and you can say, I guess God was justified, God needed to punish the Jewish people at that time, but it also gives a bit of a message of hope, because then, the next generation and future generations can try to right the wrongs. And if you can correct the sins that brought about the destruction, then you stand a fighting chance of being given a new opportunity to try again. But if the sins are still on the table and on the books, then you don't really stand a chance of a new opportunity. So the rabbis point to the sins that I've put in black. They point to three major sins that tipped the scales and brought the destruction of the first temple. And those are the three cardinal sins, murder, idolatry, and forbidden sexual relationships. And many of those sins we hear about in the prophets at the time of the first temple. The prophets warned the kings, they warned the nation. The destruction is imminent. And they spoke about the ills in society and the sins right, that were rampant. And they warned the people, correct your sins, and then maybe you can push off and stave off destruction. Maybe you, the city won't be destroyed. So the prophets do speak about the sins that the rabbis point to in black. 
But what I put in green are some of the central themes of the prophets of the first temple period. And those are interpersonal sins, sins that include the breakdown of the justice system, oppression of the poor, of the widow, of the orphan, the uh, mistreatment of slaves they talk about. And it's the social and the sins against God, like idolatry, right, that become the basis for destroying the first temple. But when the rabbis in the Talmud discuss why the second temple was destroyed, they say in contrast to those people of the first temple period who were sinning against God and who were sinning against their neighbor, the people of the second temple period were keeping the mitzvot. They were God-fearing, they kept the mitzvot, they even did gemilut chasadim, they even did some nice acts to their neighbor. So why was the second temple destroyed? And the answer that the Talmud gives is what's called sinat chinam, what's translated in English as baseless hatred. What does that mean, sinat chinam? Very often it's understood as hating for no reason. But I think a deeper explanation can be that they had no respect for alternative views and perspectives. They kept lots of mitzvot, they kept the letter of the law very scrupulously. But, and this explanation was suggested by a sage at the end of the 19th century in Eastern Europe, of Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin. He writes in his introduction to his commentary to the Torah, he writes that the generation of the second temple period kept lots of mitzvot and they were super careful in how they kept mitzvot. But went, what went wrong with them and what brought about the destruction of the second temple was sinat chinam. And what that is, he explains, is that they didn't respect alternative viewpoints. So much so that when they saw other Jews observing mitzvot differently, they automatically suspected them of being heretics, of being sectarians, and as we read in some of the Midrashim about the time of the destruction, they went so far as to literally kill and destroy the supplies of rival groups. We read that at the time of the Second Temple destruction and the revolt against Rome, there were different groups of rebels in Jerusalem at the time. And one group had such little tolerance for the other group's ideological differences that they went ahead and burned the grain silos and the storehouses. They couldn't respect the differences in their society. And even though they were keeping mitzvot, their mitzvot were crooked, right? Their mitzvot were not straight and they were not balanced with interpersonal respect. So those are the causes given for the two temples being destroyed. And the rabbis teach that if we can learn from those mistakes, then we stand a chance of having an opportunity to correct them and to have the opportunity to restore our relationship with God and have a temple. But then the rabbis teach that in every generation's time that the temple isn't rebuilt, because maybe they continue these same sins, Right? Then it's as if they destroyed the, te the temple was destroyed in their own time. So how do we take all of this and actually commemorate and mark the day? What do we do with a day that has its roots in sins that deserve theological responses of God, very harsh consequences, including the destructions of the temples, both temples, and events spanning from before the first temple was ever built, the sin of the spies, spanning after the second temple was destroyed, the final stages of the suppression of the rebellion against Rome, as well as events that fall in the Middle Ages, perhaps into the 19th and 20th century too. How do we tie all of this together into one day and how do we do that ritually? That's what we'll try to talk about. The next section is based on some of the teachings of Rabbi Soloveitchik, who was a great leader of modern orthodoxy in North America in the second half of the 20th century. 
And every Tisha B'Av, he would spend the morning hours of the day teaching and leading his community in Boston and teaching and giving expositions on the prayers and the liturgy that we'll talk about in a minute, as well as some of the larger conceptual framework to the day. And he highlighted that Tisha B'Av is unique among our fast days and that it blends two very different but complementary aspects. On the one hand, it's what we call a Ta'anit Sibur, a community fast day, like some of the other community fast days that we have on our calendar. We have one Torah fast day, that's Yom Kippur, and then we have Tisha B'Av and four other rabbinic fast days. In addition, though, Tisha B'Av has a different dimension. It has the dimension of mourning, of avelut. And now we'll explain each of these two aspects. The aspect of a communal fast day, and because Tisha B'Av is as strict as Yom Kippur, the rabbi said it includes not only eating and drinking, but it includes the four other forbidden acts that Yom Kippur includes. And because Tisha B'Av is as strict as Yom Kippur, as we mentioned, it's a sunset, right, a sundown to, to nightfall fast, a 25-hour fast, and not just from sunrise to nightfall. That's the aspect of Tisha B'Av that fits into the category of a fast day. But Tisha B'Av also has elements of mourning. And what are those? But first of all, it's important to realize that Tisha B'Av comes at the end of a period leading up to it, right? at the end of a period in which we gradually increase mourning and abstainment from pleasure. The period began three weeks ago with the 17th of Tammuz, and on the calendar of destroying the temples, right, this is the second date already. The first date was in the fall, in the month of Tevet. On the 10th of Tevet, the siege was laid against the city of Jerusalem in the Book of Kings. Then, in the summer, three weeks ago, in the month of Tammuz, the walls were breached. The Babylonians broke through the walls and entered into the city. And then, three weeks later, on Tisha B'Av, they burnt and destroyed the city and the temple. And the rabbis teach that during the period of the three weeks, we begin certain acts of mourning and abstainment from pleasure. Those intensify with what we call the nine days from the first of the month of Av. And then they intensify further into the week of Tisha B'Av. So in our case, from Saturday night until now. And Tisha B'Av is the day in which we're the most intensely focused. And what Rabbi Soloveitchik taught is something very interesting. He suggested that this incremental, gradual increase in the intensity of our morning rites actually has a reverse parallel to the personal morning practices. In personal mourning, when somebody, God forbid, loses a relative, they begin at the most intense stage. In halacha, that's called being an onen. That's the stage before burial, when the person's grief is the greatest, and their primary concern is to take care of all of the funeral arrangements that are necessary in order to bring their loved one to burial. And during that most intense stage, a person is actually exempt from all mitzvot. They don't need to pray. They're not allowed to study Torah. They're not allowed to have meat and wine, any form of enjoyment. That is the most intense stage. And interestingly enough, says Rav Soloveitchik, right, an individual doesn't need to be told that really. That's what the natural human response to death and grief would be. Leave me alone, don't obligate me in anything, right? And let the person deal with their grief. 
But the, from the moment that the funeral ends, the person enters the next stage, the Shiva stage. Seven days of mourning where they're meant to stay at home, focused on talking about the deceased, talking about their loss, sitting if possible on a low chair, right? the custom is to tear the garment, right? They are an active mourner. They're allowed to eat meat during the week then. They're allowed to study Torah. They're obligated to perform mitzvot. But their focus is still very one-dimensional on the loss and on the deceased. And at the end of the Shiva, the halacha mandates that they re-enter the world. They go back to work, right? They sit on regular chairs, they wear regular clothes. They maintain certain rites of mourning. They don't necessarily shave or get their hair cut until the end of the shloshim, a 30-day period, the end of the month. So we go from the stage before the funeral to the week, to the month, and then at the end of the month, if it's a parent, right? If it's not a parent, the mourning ends then. If it's a parent, certain other forms of personal mourning continue, but in a much lesser manner throughout the year. So the personal mourning begins with the most intense stage, and halacha dictates that the person gradually move back into life and moving to the future. They remember. They share love and respect for the deceased, but they have to slowly be moved forward, step by step, away from their intense grief. In contrast, the period of time that we're in, leading up to Tisha B'Av, has gradually increasing grief. Right? We start at the bottom with the three-week period, then it gets more intense within that period, the nine days of the month of Av, even more intense in the week of Tisha B'Av, and Tisha B'Av is the most intense. Tisha B'Av is like that state of being before the burial. When a person doesn't study Torah, doesn't have meat or wine, right, isn't really obligated in mitzvot, right, in the sense that Right? Your main focus needs to be the loss. And on Tisha B'Av, as we mentioned, we have multiple losses which get collapsed into this one day. And the rituals of Tisha B'Av strive to help us focus on the losses, just like one does in their personal mourning, in the most intense stages, both at the funeral and during the Shiva, the focus of conversation ought to be the beloved, the lost one. You speak about the person's qualities, you tell stories, you talk about what it means to have lost them. And of course, as somebody's personal mourning goes on, they have a different sense of perspective, right? At the end of a week and at the end of a month and at the end of a year, a person will reflect back and speak about what they've lost differently because you gain perspective. On Tisha B'Av, we are that mourner. We're in that most intense stage of mourning, and we are supposed to, just like the personal mourner, be fully consumed with our loss. And so how do people do that ritually? They sit on low chairs or on the floor. They don't greet people just like the mourner doesn't greet people during Shiva. They don't study Torah study for enjoyment, only things related to Tisha B'Av. And we'll talk in a minute. There are different forms of eulogies that we give over the loss. But all of this is only until midday because after midday, we begin to, like in our chart here, we begin to step out. We begin to re-enter like the mourner at the end of the Shiva. We have to begin to re-enter. So how do we describe the loss? At night, and in some communities also during the day, we read Megillat Echa, the Book of Lamentations. In a minute, I'll give a more detailed description. 
Okay. And the other way we discuss the loss and describe the loss is through a liturgy which is unique to, to Tisha B'Av called kinot. The fancy English word is elegies, poems of lament and destruction. We'll talk for a minute about both of these forms of describing the loss. But what do we describe in both the Book of Echa and in the kinot? We describe, on the one hand, the temple, its glory, who served there, what went on, but we talk about also some more of the bigger ideas. We talk about the concept of being sovereign in our own land. We talk about being in our land and having a temple as opportunities for growing close to God. And it's those themes that we highlight in the rituals of Tisha B'Av, both in the physical morning rituals and in the liturgy, which focuses on opportunities to give a eulogy, to talk about what was lost. So in Megillat Echa, in the Book of Lamentations, which the rabbis teach was written by the prophet Jeremiah, we read of an eyewitness account to the destruction of the first temple. We read of the physical suffering, we read of spiritual dimensions of the destruction. We read of some very gruesome details of what human beings had to go through at the time of the siege and the destruction. And we also read of some of the sins. Why did this happen? The eyewitness describes Jerusalem pre-destruction and Jerusalem at the time of the destruction. And on the one hand, he describes the glory of Jerusalem before the destruction but he also describes the brokenness, those social sins, right? The breakdown of the justice system, the oppression, murder, idolatry. He describes several of the sins. The Megillah is written, four of the five chapters, is written in the order of the Aleph Bet, of the Hebrew alphabet. And just like in English, when we say that something is from A to Z, right, we mean it's all-inclusive. And in order to try to describe the undescribable, the destruction, the prophet Jeremiah is aided by using the Aleph Bet. We need to give it a little bit of structure. And what we're trying to convey is that there's a lot in there, right? A lot happened, even if I might not even be able to express it. So the A to Z, the Aleph to Tuf framework, on the one hand, conveys the magnitude. It's so much, right? I need from A to Z to be able to explain it to you. But it also gives a little bit of a framework to begin to try to, do, to grapple with so much destruction. Megillat Echa, from its name, already poses major theological questions that continue to resound in the five chapters of the Megillah. The name Echa means why, Ech, how? And it opens with the question, how did it happen that the city that used to be populated and glorious is in ruins? And the Megillah continues asking the question of how, asking the question of why, and asking difficult theological questions of God like, did you do this? For, are you leaving the Jewish people and abandoning them forever? And the Megillah also ends on a theological note when it calls God to please. Can't you restore the days of old? Can't you bring us back to what we used to have? So Megillah Techa, in many ways, is a form of a eulogy. It's a form of grappling as the mourner with the loss. And in order to grapple with the loss, you have to describe what was, you have to describe what you lost, what the destruction is, and you begin to start to process theologically, what does all of this mean? At least you put the questions on the table, the why, the how, and the where do we go from here. The second genre in our Tisha B'Av liturgy is called kinot. Kina is a biblical word for mourning, for lamenting, 
And as we read today in the Haftarah, there were actually paid people in society whose job was to come to a funeral and do the job, right? And lead the group in, lead the mourners in the wailing and in the mourning and in the lamenting. So a kina is a form of religious poetry, what we call piyut, but it's a form which is a eulogy. It's a form that's a lament. And again, just like we saw in Echa, just like a good eulogy does, you describe what was, you describe the destruction, and then you try to draw some conclusions. You talk about the so what, what does it matter that we lost it? What's the meaning, the theological meaning to having lost the following? And what's interesting is that in the Kinot liturgy, we don't only discuss the temples. We span much more even than that list of those events that I put on, the five events in the Mishnah. I put on the expulsion from England and the expulsion from Spain. But in the Kinot liturgy, we weave in events that have no technical connection to Tisha B'Av. And what we say about all of the events is that they share a common packaging. And that's why we use today to talk about each of them together. And what do they share? What they share is a perspective that Jewish suffering happens. Jewish suffering happens throughout the ages and is brought upon us by God and for, for causes, for sins. But all of Jewish suffering shares the common message that God hasn't abandoned us and that God has a bigger picture and plan and out of the smaller tragedy, God has a bigger picture for reclaiming the Jewish people and keeping his connection with them. And in some of the keynote, we actually mention the idea that we can't have separate days of suffering for each event, because then unfortunately the Jewish calendar, especially if we now took our Jewish calendar of Jewish communities from all over the globe, right? The Jewish calendar would look pretty awful. It would be a terribly depressing year. And Jews can't live that way. And in one of the keynote, it uses a very clear expression that it's, we need to put it all on one day because we can't live in the Valley of Tears. We can't live with what used to be called in the 19th century scholars of Jewish history, they used to call it the Wissenschaft School of Jewish History, right? The scholars, the scientific scholarship. And they spoke about, right, the, Jewish history of tears. I will, in a minute, also highlight something from Exine. Thank you. Okay. Um, and the message of the keynote is that we, yes, we use today to tie in lots of Jewish tragedy, including keynote that were written over the Holocaust. There are at least six to eight that are out on the market that are included in different communities' liturgy. There are keynote that were written over, I saw a recent one that was even written over our current situation, trying to make some theological sense over what it means to have lost communal life now during COVID. So a contemporary kina written for that now. But the keynote try to tie together Jewish suffering, but also to limit Jewish suffering. We don't want our calendar filled with Jewish suffering. And the keynote also grapple with those same theological questions that the Megillah of Echa grappled with. The other part of grappling with theological questions we do in the Torah reading this morning. I'll very briefly just touch. The Torah reading, interestingly enough, could have taken the story from the story of the spies that we read a few weeks ago. We touched on it even on Shabbat in Dvarim, a shorter version of that but we didn't. The Torah reading that was picked is from this coming week's Torah reading from Va'et Hanan, from the fourth chapter of Deuteronomy. And if you look at it briefly after we finish learning, you'll see that it has a cycle in it. It starts off actually over here. You'll be in the land a really long time and you'll feel good and you'll feel secure and you'll feel rooted, but that's going to lead you to sin 
sin of idolatry. And God's going to intervene and punish when you continue to sin and worship idols, and he'll send the Jewish people into exile. And in exile, they'll continue to worship idolatry. And then, says the Torah reading, at the end of days, after being in exile a really long time, then the Jewish people will start the process of tshuva, of returning to God and calling out and saying, maybe there's a way to fix things. And at the end of the Torah reading, God will bring you back and you'll be in the land a long time. And the message of the Torah reading is to cut it over here and not to turn it into a cycle as human nature is prone. Because the message of the Torah reading is that you can explain the day. The day is a day of tragedy that comes a result as a result of sin, but it doesn't have to be an endless cycle. It doesn't have to be a vicious cycle. It can be a linear line. You can get back to the land and make it work, right? And the message of the Torah reading is, if you stop and listen when you get back to the land, it will stay that way and it will not continue. I'm purposely skipping the Haftarah for time's sake, right? The rabbis teach that whoever mourns over Jerusalem on Tisha B'Av or at the other finite opportunities during the calendar year that we have for mourning will merit to see its rebuilding. And this statement raises interesting theological questions in our day and age when we are 72 years into right, Jewish sovereignty in the land of Israel. Right? If you look at the picture, we have a lot of rebuilding going on. Right? And the question really comes up, right? how do Jews in the modern era, right, grapple on the one hand with Tisha B'Av as a day of discussing and describing what we've lost, but balancing and keeping perspective that we're very blessed and fortunate in these last 72 years to be doing something which Jews throughout Jewish history for, for over 2,000 years couldn't imagine, which is right, having a Jewish state rebuilding physically, spiritually as well. And I'd say that perhaps one of the most important messages of Tisha B'Av 2020 is that we watch out for those original sins that set the process off in the first place. And especially the interpersonal sins of the second temple period, the lack of respect, the factionalism, right? The lack of ideological tolerance for the other and that both here in Israel and across the Jewish world, we have enough actual problems to deal with. So we shouldn't make more problems, right, by adding in faction, factionalism and tension and friction, and that part of what Tisha B'Av calls for is much greater tolerance and respect between Jews, as well as strengthening our commitment to the land, to God, because that actually is the biblical covenantal promise to Abraham and to his descendants, right? God promises him this triangle of covenantal relationship between God, the people, the land, in the land, keeping the laws of God. And if we can strengthen all of those, right, then we should merit, hopefully, that Tisha B'Av will turn into a day of rejoicing, because the prophets teach that Tisha B'Av and the other fast days connected to the destruction of the temple will ultimately turn into times of celebration and rejoicing, both because we'll have righted the wrongs and because we'll have restored our relationship with God. So we can hopefully take the rituals of Tisha B'Av and use them for a form of a tikkun of moving forward and correcting and we don't take the mourning and the fasting in order to end there. They're supposed to lead somewhere. They're supposed to lead us to improving our relationship with other Jews, or improving our relationship with God, strengthening our connection to the land, and hopefully right, leading all of us into a better period. And certainly this year with COVID and so much more separation between people, right? 
we actually ironically have the opportunity to unite like we're doing here, right? We actually have the opportunity to bring Jews together from so many different communities here. We have 62 different participants, right? And hopefully we should take that as something positive to move forward from this awful COVID period, right? And use it as an opportunity to continue to unite Jews together and lead to a redemption. If anybody wants to stay on for questions, I'm happy to.